So just an introduction for those of you who don't know me, I am Michael Wunsch, I'm the plant pathologist here in Carrington, and, uh, and anyhow, we, uh, we pretty much work on all the crops uh, grown on the state out here for, on the pathology end, and so uh, it's a great place uh, for anyone who's from western North Dakota, this is an ideal place to study the diseases of the western crops because it's just a little more human here. And so we can reliably get the diseases, which is why nobody grows them out here. But it's great for studying management of those diseases. Um, uh, you have to get the disease to study it. And then we, of course, study the eastern crops as well. And the crops grown in this area, uh, which are increasingly are resembling the eastern crops. So today's talk is on soybeans, um, which I know all of you work with very closely, and uh, root rots specifically, so early season diseases. And so I'm going to pass out these roots, and I want, uh, I want you to look at the, uh, the symptoms, and, um, and I want you to tell me what you think this is. Uh, keep in mind that root rots are notoriously difficult to identify by sight, but you can still uh, make an educated guess. All right, so what do you think that is? What, first of all, tell me what you're seeing on those roots. Describe the symptoms. Okay, um, you could get some damping off. You, you see a little bit of wilting every day we collected a few hours ago. Uh, you could get some damping off if it gets bad enough. But damping off, we usually refer to damping off if the foliar tissues are actually wilted over and dying, okay? Uh, these plants, when I collected them, and now they're wilted now, these plants, when I collected them, were vigorous and green, okay? And so they weren't actually uh, dying in that, in that sense, but... Okay, um, so that could be, a, could be a definite, oh, you're looking up here? So that purple coloration you're seeing just by the cotyledons, a lot of times, a lot of times you'll see that on soybean seedlings. And I wouldn't actually look at that as a disease symptom. What I'm actually looking at in this case is, you look on the lower, on the actual root section, you're going to see some brown streaks, brownish, reddish streaks, okay? And so you see right there, you see a kind of a brown streak. And there you are. Okay, so what is this? What do you think? Brownish red streaks. Is, is it soft? Are the lesions soft? Squishy, soft? Or are they kind of hard? Firm. Firm, they're kind of firm, right? Do you think they're noticeably sunken? Like, is, are they sunken in a good millimeter or so? Or is it pretty much flush with the, with the surrounding tissue? Just starting to sink. It's just starting to sink a little bit, somewhat flush, a little bit sunken, but not severely, right? Okay, so first of all, they're, they're, they're pretty soft, they're pretty firm, right? What, what, what disease do you think this might be? Rhizoc? Okay, Rhizoctonia is a candidate, absolutely. Is there, an, what, what, is there another candidate here? Okay, what are the big four root, root rots on soybeans? Phytophthora. Phytophthora, great. Rhizoctonia, we got that one. What was that one? Fusarium. Fusarium, okay. Pythium. Pythium, awesome. Okay, so normally you think of Phytophthora and Pythium, these are going to often produce, um, well, later on the Phytophthora, no, but early on, these early growth stages, oftentimes you have uh, more soft lesions, okay? Um, but later, later on, Phytophthora is different, okay? But uh, the Rhizoc and the Fusarium will be firm like this, okay? Now in this case, as I told you when we first first started, it's very hard to accurately, uh, with 100% confidence, identify root rot splash by pure sight. You need to take, take things into the lab to be 100% confident. But looking at these symptoms, I would say that 90-95% of these symptoms are caused by Fusarium. Okay, is that, that reddish, brick, brickish, that kind of brick red, to dark, brick red to slight, somewhat brown discoloration is not severely um, uh, sunken, okay, and they're in streaks. It's very characteristic of Fusarium root rot. Now, that said, you could very well have some rhizoc contributing, okay. Uh, these pathogens often do not occur singly, so you often get combinations. These are very characteristic of, of Fusarium root rot, though, for sure, and I can tell you that with, um, like, I don't really have confidence. I plate these out in the lab and get lots of fusarium uh, growing out. Okay, and so now next next ones. Now this is what we would consider damping off right here. These seedlings in these bags. I'm passing around the bags because the tissues are just too too gentle to be uh, delicate 
uh, too rotted, okay, to uh, withstand much handling. Okay, um, but this is what you would consider damping off. These seedlings, uh, they emerged, okay, and uh, and uh, and they were just uh, short. They died shortly thereafter, if you will. Okay, so those are classic post-emergence damping off symptoms. Okay, uh, the plant has emerged, and so your cotyledons are up. You hit, see those uh, the, the the first two leaves that are still folded up in there many times. Okay, uh, that's post-emergence damping off. And uh, in this case, those tissues are uh, very soft, and they're also um, well. I'll let you guys describe it. Describe describe the symptoms on those on those on those on those seedlings. Secondary and tertiary roots are pruned off. They're gone. Okay. Secondary and tertiary roots may be pruned off. Okay. Oh well. In this case, I didn't even get the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get the bottom. But actually, what you want to look at on this one, you see up here. This is soft and rotted, and it's actually very severely discolored. This is no longer that purple color. This is a dark brown. Okay? And this is soft rotted. Okay? It's so badly soft rotted that you actually, you actually, this is actually just frayed as I was pulling it out. Okay? But you see that you basically get, you get uh, basically like a, uh, here on the hypocotyl you get, you get a section of tissue here that's that's just rotted through, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. And as far as the lower lower part, well, this broke off as I as I was digging it up, okay? Very soft tissue. Uh, this is pithi Pythium or Phytophthora. Now, in this case, it came from inoculated Phytophthora trial, and I'll tell you with pretty high confidence, especially when you see this dark color up here, that's Phytophthora, okay? Uh, and this one too, that very dark color. A lot of times the pythium will not cause that much discoloration. Okay, and uh, these two pathogens both form resting structures in the tissues and I took a tiny, tiny piece of tissue about a millimeter wide by two millimeters long and put it under the, on a microscope slide under the, uh, 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 and put it under the scope and you wouldn't believe the number of those resting structures that were in that tissue. Tons of them and those are what persist in the soil. This one our later season symptoms for the most part, so we're not in that part of the growing season yet. Uh, so I've got, I've got pictures, and I want you to tell me what you think this is. Okay, does everyone have one? So in the lower pictures, what do you, describe the symptoms you're seeing. Do you see something uh, not so healthy looking in those, in those soybeans? On the, I guess it would be C and E. C and E, what's, what's going on there? Wilting. Wilting, okay. So what diseases do we know of that are common in this area, in North Dakota, that cause those types of symptoms, the wilting symptoms? Sclerotinia. Sclerotinia is one of them. What's another one? Phytophthora. Phytophthora is the other one. Perfect. Those are our two major ones that will cause these types of symptoms. So how do we distinguish the two? Okay, very often you have the shepherd's hook, and that's what you see on picture C, and you actually see it on an E as well. You see that hook on the top? Okay, the other thing is now you look at pictures D and F. Describe those lesions to me. These are phytophthora lesions. Describe them to me. So you got this, uh, this, this reddish brown lesion that comes up from the root and moves up the main stem. Okay, and it's only there at the soil line up a few inches. It can be up five, six inches but it extends from the soil line up. Okay, Walt, I know that you know sclerotinia in and out. So, how about you describe to me how this compares to sclerotinia symptoms on the stem? Well, you wouldn't have any of this black. You'd have a sclerotinia on there, and it'd be a watery mess. Okay. Yeah, so you're going to get... You, yeah, you're going to get, uh, as, what, as Walt was saying, when sclerotinia is well-developed, and these lesions are well-developed, okay, you're going to get... You can get bleached, watery lesions, so awesome times with some fuzzy white growth, and maybe some little black, black uh, um, growths in there, right? Rat dung. What, what do you say? You get rat dung. Rat dung, absolutely. Yeah, fungal rat dung. Would you see the formation of the white bloom on there if it was If it's humid and the canopy is still closed, 
Once the um, once the disease has gotten bad enough and the canopy opens up, your humidity drops and it'll just turn into bleach tissue when you'll no, no longer see the fuzziness. Okay? Um, but one thing I want to tell you is that sclerotinia, when it first starts, has these reddish brown lesions right when it's starting. That's right, Walt, well, isn't it? Right? Well, okay, it does right when it's starting. Okay? And uh, as it grows, then it turns into this bleach section. But when you see that when it's sclerotinia, it can be anywhere in the plant. It can be on the side branches, it can be in the middle of the stem, and often it's going to be at like one of the, one of the branch points on the plant. Okay, and you're not going to see it extending up from the roots like this. Okay, and by all means it's not going to be localized, just extending up from the roots. So if you see this coming up from the roots, you have a pretty surefire diagnosis of Phytophthora. Okay, now Bertolin Nelson, who's the, who's the soybean pathologist with NDSU, has described Phytophthora root rot as being the most important disease of soybeans in eastern North Dakota. Okay, and I don't, here in central North Dakota, it's a little bit less important, but I would expect it to be growing in importance as our soybean acreage increases and as we get uh, you know, increasing numbers of wet years. This disease likes it wet. What I'd like to do now is step back a little bit and talk a little bit about management. When, what, when do you expect the main damage to occur from Fusarium and Rhizoctonium? Seedling stage, right? Okay, so Fusarium and Rhizoctonium will, co will cause seeds to rot and newly emerged seeds to die before they even get to the surface. Okay, we call that pre-emergence damping off. They will also cause some damping off right after emergence, okay? These are seedling diseases though, right? Okay, uh, when does Pythium uh, cause this damage? Right after the seedling stage. Okay, so Pythium can cause damage right at the seedling stage. Soil surface girdling. Okay, absolutely, it can definitely do some of that. And actually I have some examples here. This is the other one. It has some soil surface girdling on them if anyone wants to see them. And I took these under the scope, and what do you know, I saw the, the resting structures in there. It could be Pythium or Phytophthora. But you have, uh, let's see, here you have some soil surface girdling that's just, just getting going, and I took a chunk out right there, that's why I looked at under the scope. But it's just starting, it's not that bad yet, but it's just getting going. Okay, uh, that's very initial symptoms, and you see some of that same action going on, on one side of the stem here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you want to pass those around, you're welcome to do so. Um, yeah. Those are initial symptoms. That's going to get worse with time. That's going to get worse with time. But those are typical symptoms of Pythium or Phytophthora. But that Pythium is traditionally causes most of its damage either right before emergence or right after. So seedling stage. Now, when you uh, look for soybean varieties, you often get disease scores, okay? Uh, so what are some of the common diseases that, that, that are rated? If you look for a resistance, it's, it'll tell you how resistant or susceptible the variety is or to, to, to disease X, you know? And there, there are certain diseases that almost all the, soy, all the companies will give you ratings for. Uh, to, can you tell me a couple of those, those diseases? Sudden death syndrome. Sudden death, great. Perfect, okay. Notice of our root rots, only one of them is representative, and it's, it's Phytophthora. Okay? And you never get, I've never seen a Pythium rating, I've never seen a Fusarium rating, I've never seen a Rhizoctonia rating. So why do you think that is? Okay? Number one, you don't have a whole lot of tolerance. Okay? That's one thing, right? There is some variability and susceptibility. But there, that's, one, that's one aspect. But what's, can you think of another reason? They're easily controlled seed treatment. There you have it. That's the other bit. The other three are primarily seed and seedling diseases. They can affect, old, they will affect older plants too, but their effect on older plants is limited to a slight reduction in vigor usually. Okay? And if they, you can get the plant through that seedling stage, yeah, the fusarium is going to hurt you a little bit, the rhizoc is going to hurt you a little bit, the pythium is going to hurt you a little bit, but if you can get it through to, say, the second trifoliate leaf stage, you know, you've, you pass the gate, you still have your soybean stand there. Yeah, you're going to lose some vigor to, if you have quite a bit of fusarium or pythium or whatever, but you, you've got something there, right? 
Well, how is phytophthora different? Okay, you can... Absolutely, your plant can die even when it's potting. You look at these pictures that I passed around, these plants here, I mean, you're losing some pretty mature plants. You know, they're well past the seedling stage, down at pictures C and E, especially E. Okay, you can lose plants at, you know, you can lose plants in mid-late bloom, okay? Early pod set, mid-pod set. And so Phytophthora is not a disease you can solely, can solely manage with seed treatments. Okay, and so it really matters what the variety, uh, it really matters how much resistance the variety has. Because how many weeks do you usually consider a seed treatment, treatment giving you protection for? Four to five. Okay, that's about right. I, it's usually you consider about 30 days from planting. Okay, and I can tell you I have seen this in seed treatment trials where we inoculate and really create conditions that are favorable for the disease because we want to screen fungicides for their efficacy. And you can see it, it will, you'll, you'll get this great control, great control, and then at about the 30 day mark, if the conditions persist for in, in terms of being favorable for the disease, you can see a real cutoff in terms of control. And when you see, where you see that cutoff is with the phytophthora. Okay, um, because by that point, your Pythium, your Fusarium, your Rhizoc, well, you've gotten through the really, really, uh, you know, critical period for them, but the Phytophthora, you can get some real plant loss at that point. So, that said, can someone tell me a little bit about resistance to Phytophthora? What are the, uh, what are the two ways that you can, what are the two resistance, uh, um, what are your options when you are, uh, when you're buying soybean seed for, for, for Phytophthora management? 1C, 1K, or 3A. Okay, so there you have resistance genes. Can someone describe to me how the resistance genes operate? Okay, resistance genes give you complete immunity against specific races of Phytophthora. Okay, those races of those particular particular strains of Phytophthora, what they can do is they can invade, they'll actually still invade the soybean plant, okay? But they get stopped after about 12 or 14 hours. And then and then the plant walls them off and they can't go any further. Okay, the, so if you have, say, a 3A resistance gene, it will, it will protect against a certain suite of races of Phytophthora, but not every race. Okay, I believe it's race 21 that's in North Dakota that, that will cause disease on, on soybean varieties with, with RPS3A. Okay, uh, RPS1K goes down to races 25 and 28. Okay, RPS1C, I believe that goes down to race 4, okay, and some others, okay, and uh, these are races that we have in North Dakota right now, for sure, we know we have them, okay, and so these resistance genes will give you complete immunity against specific races, but not other races of the pathogen. So if you, if you happen to have... Um, if your races of Phytophthora in there are controlled by RPS3A, then you'll get no Phytophthora root rot at all. Okay? And you, and you plant a variety with RPS3A. But if you have a mixture of races in your field, some of which are controlled by RPS3A and some of which are not, you're still going to get some, some Phytophthora. And you're going to be getting Phytophthora from a race such as race 21 that is aggressive against RPS3A. So next year, if you, if you planted a soybean variety with RPS3A in your field, and you got a little bit of Phytophthora root rot, okay, you know that that Phytophthora root rot is a race that is aggressive against RPS3A, right? You know that. It's going to be. Unless the soybean company made a mistake and not all your plants had RPS3A in them. Okay? And so next year, what do you think about your, 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 soybean, your Phytophthora population in that field? Are you going to have more of that race that's aggressive against 3A in that field? Yeah, you are. It's going to increase. So if you place plant RP, a variety with RPS3A in that field again next year, and it's wet again, do you expect to have more Phytophthora? It's a given that you will. Because you have just selected for those, fungal, those, those Phytophthora individuals that are aggressive against that resistance gene. Okay? And so... The resistance genes you can think of as an arms race. Okay, you think of the Cold War, right? 
you know, the Soviets built a, built a certain, certain type of missile for, 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 uh, for nuclear warheads. We come out and try to build a better one. And then the Soviets try to build a better one, right? Cold War, right? This is the same deal. Uh, the Phytophthora pathogen is trying to cause disease, and we're trying to protect ourselves against it. You know, we put out a new resistance gene, and uh, eventually we start selecting for individuals that are aggressive against that resistance gene, then we have to switch it out. It wasn't too long ago that people were using RPS1C, right? RPS1K, right? So now we're on 3A, 6, but I'll tell you what, we're going to have to keep on switching these up. At this point in time, we know of 14 different resistance genes that we can deploy, and only a handful of these are being used. But, I mean, it is a race, and you always, the big worry is what happens when we've gone through our 14 that we know of. Right? <laughs> so that's part of the package. You'll also find another type of disease rating for Phytophthora on when you're buying soybean varieties. What is that? Tolerance. Tolerance. Can someone describe to me what tolerance is? That's how well the plant can uh, survive even though it's infected. Perfect. Yeah, and that's a great explanation. How well the plant can survive even though it's infected, okay? So there are some plants that if they get infected, say they have RPS3A, but you have a race that's aggressive against 3A, so the plant gets infected, there are going to be some varieties that just go down. They, are, they get infected and they die. They have the little crook nest, crook's nest that you, uh, neck that you see there, and they are gone. There are other varieties that are more tolerant. Yes, they'll get infected, you'll see the disease, but they still, they still make it. They might have reduced vigor, sort of like if you have some fusarium root rot, but they'll still make it. Okay, so that's what tolerance is. And tolerance does not give you immunity, but it gives, it's basically, um, uh, you know, basically a better immune system, if you will. It's a lots of little genes, it's harder for the fungus to overcome, it, to overcome them, okay, and it gives you some backup protection. So, that's why you'll often see, even if there is an RPS gene in there, say RPS1K or whatever, you also, also see, often also see a tolerance rating. And the ideal package, if you can get your yield and every other characteristic you want for fortified tophtra management, your ideal package is an RPS gene that you think is going to hold up in your field, plus a relatively elevated tolerance, because the tolerance will help keep in check whatever races are not controlled by that RPS gene. Okay, so with that in mind, what I will do here is I will pass out another handout here, and this handout here gives you a reference again about how well the different RPS genes were holding up the last time Phytophthora was surveyed. So Berlin Nelson, uh, the soybean pathologist on, uh, in, 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 at NDSU, did a survey of Phytophthora uh, in North Dakota in 1993. He repeated it in 2002 to 2004, and by my calculation we are due for another one, by all means. In 1993 he found four races Race 3 was predominant, okay? In 2002 to 2004, you can count how many races he found, but it's well in excess of 10. And race 3 was no longer predominant, okay? Race 4 was, and race 4, by my calculation, became predominant because of the widespread use of RPS1C, okay? Which RPS4 overcome, with race 4 overcomes. So who knows what's happened now that a decade has passed since he did this survey. It would behoove us to know, because that would allow us to know uh, what RPS genes we should be use, using, and, uh, and whether the soybean breeders, the companies, need to be starting to bring out some other RPS genes into their arsenal. Okay? So what you see on this sheet is a uh, first picture of what the resting structures of Phytophthora look like under the microscope. These are, uh, you have a blown up picture on the left. On the right, you see uh, a section of root tissue from an infected plant, and all those little circles are those resting structures. It gives you a very good illustration of what I just saw under the scope, okay? And uh, just how many resting structures are formed. Second, you're going to see um, a list of known RPS genes, and you'll know some of these will be familiar to you. Okay, some of them will not, because we don't have them in our varieties out here, right, at this point. 
And then you have races of Phytophthora soja uh, that were detected in a survey a decade ago uh, here in North Dakota. So take one, pass them around. Let's just skip over to the column that says race. Okay, this is your second column in. Okay, this is your race number. Okay, and that's just a that's just a way that we classify uh, a particular strain of Phytophthora in terms of which resistance genes it overcomes. Okay. And so if you look to the left, it says virulence phenotypes. This would be the resistance genes, this would be the, uh, the list of resistance genes that the particular race causes disease on. So if you have race 21 in your field, which as I talked about earlier, that means you're going to get disease if you plant a soybean variety with RPS1A, with RPS3A, or RPS7. Okay? If you have race uh, one, every RPS gene except RPS7 is going to give you protection. Okay, RPS7, you're going to get disease. Okay, and uh, race three, again, a common um, race. Th race three is a very common race in North Dakota. Race four is a very common race in North Dakota. And you notice that race four overcomes RPS1C. And again, race four is extremely prevalent in North Dakota. This is why RPS1C doesn't work. Okay. That's why it's failed. And you'll see the, the, that races 28 and 25 and 41 and F all over, and 40 all overcome RPS1K. Back in 2002 to 2004, those races were not terribly prevalent. But based on, on the reports on how poorly RPS1K has been performing, I bet they're a lot more prevalent now. I bet those races are a lot more prevalent now, okay? And so, um, in this case, he tells you the number of fields he detected that race in, um, number of fungal individuals, we call them isolates, uh, he, he pulled out uh, for these different races. Um, but the big thing that you care about is which races are going down because of the, uh, uh, which RPS genes are failing due to the races that exist here in North Dakota. And the, the list of the RPS genes on the left are the ones that we know will fail to some of the races that are out there. Okay? Now, just because we know that there's race R28 out there in the States, doesn't mean that you have race 28 in your field. Uh, that's how you read that table. And the um, last thing I want to tell you is I have a little description about the biology up here of Phytophthora. And what I want to stress to you is that this pathogen reproduces sexually, which means that it, it, continually, it continually produces variability in its offspring. And you do not need to bring in another race from another field in order to have a race shift in your field. Okay? Just your native population in your field produces enough variability to have a race shift. So you can have an RPS gene that was working for you for many years that will stop work working for you just because of the reproductive process and the genetic variability of the fungus, okay?